Elizabeth Evans and I'm a homeschooling mom of four young kids. I'm figuring this out as I go, but I'm here to talk to Bonnie, who has been writing and speaking on the subject for over a decade and has been homeschooling for three decades. My name's Bonnie Landry. I've got seven kids. They're ages 13 to 33. I've been homeschooling for 29 years. I'm a wife, a mom, a grandma, um, I'm a speaker and a writer, and I'm an advocate of joy. So uh, we're here to provide this podcast so that homeschooling can look like you imagined it to be. Hello. Hi, good evening, how are you? Good, how are you? Great, yeah. So um, summer's starting here, so things are very lovely and I'm thrilled because the garden's exploding and yeah I've yeah, seen pictures yeah, yeah. <laughs> looks lovely I don't know I just want to share all that growth <laughs> right right yeah yeah it feels like a miracle it feels like a miracle yeah I, I just uh yeah I'm amazed by you know you put things in the ground and they grow like what is right. that all about <laughs> I know we've got a I'm trying a small garden this year we've got carrots and cucumbers spinach and peppers cool. just popped up oh nice yeah oh and strawberries Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. We didn't yeah. do peppers, but we did all the other stuff and some potatoes and things I've never tried before. So yeah. Yeah. That's well, fun. It is fun. Are you yeah. kind of self-sustaining or just veggie garden? No, 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 stuff? not at all. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, just, we just grow some vegetables and what I'm trying to do, I'm actually working on a little project right now uh, that I'm excited about. So Vancouver, Island, you've ever heard of the hundred mile, hundred mile diet? No. Okay. So the hundred mile diet is like you try and eat food locally enough that it's been grown in within a hundred miles of oh, you. Right. Um, okay. and so Vancouver Island is quite big and it produces a lot of its own stuff. And so over the summer, I'm trying to incorporate as much as possible, uh, of things grown on Vancouver Island. Cool. And so, yeah. Check my Facebook page because, um, my, my personal one, and uh, because I'm posting there sort of once a week, kind of the highlights of the week. So we're buying all our meat is local, all our milk is local, all our veggies are local, most of our wow. fruit. Yeah, it's super fun. That's really cool. So is it cow's milk, goat's milk, both? It's cow's milk. Okay. Yeah. And the, we don't have butter. We can get local cheese. We can get local milk, local cream, local yogurt. Uh, we can't get local butter. Okay. But I'm thinking maybe I'll buy some cream and make some butter. Yeah. <laughs> Just to we, say I did. <laughs> we tried making butter this year and we actually finally got it to work, but you have to get the measurements so precise. Like if you, if you have yeah. too much cream in there, then it doesn't work. I, it's weird, yeah. but it's fun. It's fun. Really fun. You can watch it happen though. You shake your jar, shake your jar, yeah. shake your jar yeah. and then all of a sudden there's butter, right? Well, my husband got me one of those like mini mason jar butter churns. Oh. <laughs> oh. You know you could have, get those. Right. My sister oh. made fun of me. Um, she, my sister such, made fun of me because, because I wanted it. Wife? Yeah, because I wanted it. <laughs> my we just sister made jar and shake it. Yeah, yeah, we tried that. The recipe said to put a marble in there, but my eight-year-old oh. was a little too zealous, and it shattered. <laughs> he was not injured, but it shattered all over the kitchen. So. Oh, that's awesome. Trust an eight-year-old, or don't yeah. trust an eight-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> Or don't trust directions that tell you to put a marble in a glass jar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, so I'll let you know how our butter turns out. Yeah. <laughs> we even grow salt here, actually. We even really? grow salt on Vancouver Island. Yeah, yeah, there's a salt company. Isn't wow. that cool? That is cool. Yeah. I never that's actually really person. thought about where salt comes from. Yeah. I guess that's something we're going to learn tomorrow, my kids and I. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Homeschool ideas via podcast. Right, right. Yeah. So do we have some questions? We do. Um, well, since you started with talking about summers and swing, um, I guess we'll start with, this is a question from Sarah um, and it's kind of got multiple questions. Do you want me to read them all or just kind of one at a uh, time? How many multiple? Mm, four, four. Yeah, four-ish. Okay. Yeah. Let's read them all off. Okay. And then I can pick the one I, I like the best. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So what does summer vacation look like? As in, do you take a break from schooling? Right. Um, okay, when gotcha. does it start? And do all of your kids end at the same time for summer? Right. Um, and then the last part of the question is, do you keep some of school routine or do you just drop everything for the summer? Okay. 
so yeah, those are all, all kind of can probably be answered in the same conversation. So I'll tell you what we do. Uh, and homeschoolers operate very differently. So there would be homeschoolers who school all year round. Uh, there'd be homeschoolers that would, you know, do three weeks on, one week off. You know, I mean, we, we're homeschoolers. We can do whatever we want. We can homeschool at night if we want to. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, so for me, I've always felt like, you know, summer is short. And I think that we need to take advantage of all of the learning and all of the fun and all of the social stuff that happens in summer to its absolute fullest. Mm -hmm. And I personally don't want to be sort of pinned down by things that I might need to do indoors. So I always quit early. My goal is the end of May. And then we take June, July, August off. I've done this for years and years. And then we usually start a week after everybody else starts because you're going to, you guys are going to, by the end of this conversation, you're going to think I'm so slack. <laughs> okay. Because I feel like we need a, a big long break. We need a big shakeup of our routine. We need to take advantage of the beautiful weather. And those are our nicest months. So that's what I do. So go back uh, probably a week after everyone else starts. If it's really beautiful, um, I will even go longer that I, you know, don't start until the middle or end of September, because if it still feels like summer weather, I want to really take advantage of those last, you know, warm days, long days, right. uh, before we get back into a kind of the routine of fall, which I always love. I love getting back into the routine of fall. I love shopping for school supplies, Yeah, <laughs> you know, but I think it's really important to shake it off and, and not feel like, Oh no, that wasn't long enough. So, um, I absolutely quit early. So end of May has always been my goal. Uh, when the high schoolers are working through a textbook, they generally want to finish the textbook mm -hmm. before the end of the year. Now, so, I mean, if they're, we've had occasions where, you know, they've made a decision. Now you have to remember that my high schoolers are really, uh, really in charge of their own education to a large degree. Right. And so if they decide, you know, okay, well, I wanted to take two weeks off here and we went for a holiday here and, you know, that they just didn't want to feel panicky, that they might decide that, okay, I'm going to actually finish my biology over the summer and just plug away at it, you know, um, two or three days a week or, or however I want it, I want that to look, um, you know, or I will actually, you know, stop. I have three modules left, but this is a good place to stop. So I'll actually just pick it up and then I'll finish my biology and do it concurrently with whatever science I choose to do uh, next year, right? Okay. So, um, you know, they they are really kind of in charge of how they want that to roll out. Most of the time they would prefer just to finish the textbook by the end of the year. So sometimes textbooks are generally set up so that we take advantage of say 30 weeks of school mm -hmm. roughly. And, uh, you know, they prefer to finish it um, in that time frame. but you know, they, they've, made that happen lots of different ways and I'm okay with it as long as I know they're they're you know if they're close to finishing it that they're actually going to finish it and not sort of let it just peter out okay um so but other than sort of any sit down work um absolutely we sort of wrap it up by the end of May we also take a nice long Christmas vacation you know usually with three or four weeks that we take over Christmas and you cannot help but learn over Christmas, right? Like Christmas right. is its own unit study. And so the, all the writing that you do and all the activities that you do, you know, if you just let everything else, okay, let's just take a break right now and, and have that be um, its own study, you know, you, that's what you do, right? So right. you don't feel, you don't have to feel like you're not getting your schoolwork done, mm -hmm. you know? And I think this is one of the beauties, I guess, of, of not really using a lot of curriculum is that you, you're not then pressured by how, the number of pages that you have left in your right. workbook or textbook or whatever. You're not feeling the pressure of that because you can just embrace, you know, this moment, uh, what is, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so go back to the questions for a moment. I want to make sure I'm answering. Okay. Uh, uh, what does summer vacation look like? Okay. And when do you start? So you answered that. Okay. So um, what does summer vacation look like? So certainly when my kids were younger, that was when we spent a lot of time out, outdoors, exploring, doing activities, doing lots of outdoor things, a lot of time at the lake, a lot of time swimming and, you know, just physical activities, you know, family 
um, day trips, mm -hmm. you know, that sort of thing. Right. And we have a family camp that I run. So, you know, every year, this is the first time in 20 years, we haven't uh, had family camps or is pretty sad about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, but that in and of itself, because I'm an organizer, you know, the kids are really involved in, in making that happen. Right. And I think that's, there's an education in there. That's just profound. Right. So yeah. anything we choose to do over the summer, whether that's camping or hiking or, uh, you know, um, going to your local, you know, national parks or state parks and taking part of the, in their, uh, interpretive programs and all of that, you know, that you're schooling all the time, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, it's a, it's an attitude, Yeah. you know? And so you can't help but learn, you know, through the summer. So do we do our normal routine? No, but, but does lots of learning happen? Absolutely. A lot yeah. of times my kids have learned to read over the summer because, because I've just, you know, we've backed off of anything we're doing and therefore they're just picking up books and reading them. Right. Yeah. 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 So it yeah. sounds like you replace one routine with a new one for the summer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's certainly no, um, pattern to, it. I mean, usually I would continue reading to my kids yeah. uh, over the summer. Um, but you know, I would let them sleep in, you know, and let them, you know, you know, we say we were having lunch. Okay. Let's sit out at the picnic table and I'll read you guys out at the picnic table or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So a, a routine of non-routine, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Well then let's, let's go back. Um, it sounds like there, I've heard from a lot of people that they're thinking about starting to homeschool mm -hmm. this next year. It's this wave. We're going to have a wave of all these new homeschooling families. Um, yeah. but one of the things is there, there's so much information out there, different curriculums. You've got Charlotte Mason, you've got the specifically the Amble side part of Charlotte Mason. Um, it, for Catholics, there's curriculums like Seton and Mother of Divine Grace. So how, how do you choose? And I know you've said that you don't really use a curriculum. Um, yeah, yeah, we don't use a lot of curriculum, but that's not to say I've never used something from Mother of Divine Grace or something from CHC or something from um, CHC. Are you familiar? Catholic heritage curricula. Yes. Yes. Beautiful, beautiful Catholic curricula or, you know, um, plaid press or whatever, you know, I probably use things from all kinds of different, uh, different providers. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that first of all, I think if you're, if you're new to homeschooling and you're thinking about homeschooling and you're not sure where to start, I would say give it a year or two before you actually choose a curriculum because you will probably find, A, you're going to save money, but you will probably find that you will start to understand the choices and the way your family operates and the way that you can approach this better without spending a lot of money as you just sort of gently move into it right mm -hmm. so if you you know just really stuck to the basics like you know reading aloud to your kids um you know uh teaching them to read by cuddling up beside them and pointing to the words and the letters on the page and uh you know sort of thinking about i would really recommend reading ruth beechick's books uh, called, they're called the three R's. They used to come as separate books. Now they're one book because she talks about the natural inductive approach. So if your kids are, are young, and when I say young, I'm, you know, you know, 12 and under, like not just little wee kids. Um, I would, but you know, prior to high school, I would suggest reading that book because she talks about the natural inductive approach to learning and teaching. And it gives you a really good picture of how much learning is actually happening without you realizing it right yeah so i would say that's a really good place to start i would also say you know i've got my workshop up on youtube um i think a lot of the people listening to this podcast have are, have already seen it um and a lot of people asking questions have already seen it but uh it's a full day workshop where i talk about homeschooling kind of without curriculum homeschooling with joy is the name of the workshop so it's under the youtube channels under my name bonnie landry the um it's under a playlist called homeschooling with joy and the four parts of that series are are there uh but i think that it will give you the confidence to approach at least to the basics without curriculum so that you can have some time to think about what it is 
you know, what kind of homeschooler you are, what it is you would like to approach. I, I would be careful about choosing curriculum. I would say, for, I'll use Charlotte Mason as an, as an example. It's an ideology, it's not a curriculum. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful ideology. And I think when we start to curriculumize things, we can then lose ourselves in the checking of the boxes, right? Yeah. Many times over the years, I've been, it's been requested sort of, okay, how do you give me a package about how you do what you do, right? Mm -hmm. And I have very, cal in a very calculated way, I've avoided curriculumizing what I do because I'm, I really, really want to put the power in the hands of the parents mm -hmm. to know their family, to be an intimate community of life and love, which is what we are as families, and to discover, be, be willing to discover how you operate as a family and what works best as a family. So I'm not in any way, I'm not anti-curriculum. Over the years, we've used lots of different curriculum. I don't want to be owned by it. And I don't want other people to be owned by it. You know, curriculum is, can be a wonderful thing, but if it owns you and stresses you, it's not a wonderful thing anymore. Mm -hmm. So uh, Ruth Beechick's book, my workshop would definitely be places to start on you know, how, get to know your family first, get to know yourself as a homeschooler first, before you launch out and spend piles of money on curriculum, because I cannot, for those of you who are new to this game, I cannot tell you the, the you know, hundreds and hundreds of people that I've met over the years who have bought a new curriculum every year or two, and it's sitting in their basement because they thought, okay, this isn't working because I haven't got the right curriculum, right? And then when they become to, uh, to the point where they realize, okay, maybe it isn't the curriculum that's the problem here or the answer here, right? Yeah. Maybe just thinking about life without curriculum is going to help me really know what it is we need mm -hmm. as a family, right? Yeah. And so I think those are really important places to begin. Okay. Right. Self-discovery. I, I have a couple thoughts um, as you were talking. Um, one thing was I feel you know, I'm, I'm still kind of new to this, this whole idea of kind of trying to work outside of a curriculum because I did feel stressed and, um, like I couldn't finish, you know, what I set out to do with, with my kids. Right. And that is not joyful for sure. No, it's not. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, it just adds stress and weight. And then I think also unnecessary pressure on kids when, you know, I'll just speak for myself when I feel like, okay, we have to finish this. It's putting pressure on them. And then that's taking away the joy of learning. Yeah. Um, I, I think we're still kind of going through that right now. I, I want to finish our, um, our math book. I, I think I've mentioned before we use Saxon math and it works right. really well for us. Yeah. Um, we have, I think 20 lessons left in the book and then we're done. <laughs> and right. And we actually, the final lesson is learning to divide by two, I think. So to me, it's important we get to there before we head to the third grade year. Right. Um, but at the same time, it's like, oh, it's summer. My kids are kind of getting antsy. And yeah. I, I don't think there are any lessons I can skip at this point. Right. Um, yeah. And, and I think it was it two weeks ago when we were talking about dictation, maybe. Um, and you had mentioned that you, you know, with math, you kind of sit down and it's almost like, you know, what they need to be learning. And I'm not there yet. Yeah. <laughs> I feel well, like that took to some time for book. sure. Don't yeah. expect to know on your first go round. Right. Okay. You know, because, because we really don't. And so, you know, if you're, if you're, if you have a math text by you, uh, I mean, here's a thought, Elizabeth, this is just, you know, sort of for you, but I mean, sure, there's lots of parents in the same boat. So I'm going to say it anyway. You, if you looked at your Saxon math and you looked at the 20 lessons you have left, if you approach that where you thought, okay, let's look at these 20 lessons. How many of these does, does he actually already know how to do? Yeah. Right? A lot of them are review. Right. And so, uh, could we just pick out the few lessons where I feel like, okay, he might not be ready for next year uh, unless we cover these couple of things, mm -hmm. right? And pull out the lessons relevant to that and do those, 
Okay. Now, I think that that one might make you feel better. At yeah. the same time, bear in mind that next year, and I've used Saxon, so I know for sure Saxon, but every math group does this, is the first month will be spent reviewing everything you did last year. Because that, you know, textbook provider wants, you know, we know that from school, right? The first month was always mm -hmm. review about everything we had learned last year. And so, you know, you could probably, here's my guess, is you could probably not do those last 20 lessons and be just fine. Okay. Right? However, yeah. if you feel like, okay, well, there's, there's a new uh, idea here or a new concept here that I'd kind of like him to learn, mm -hmm. um, you know, because what is there in a Saxon math book? It's like 160 lessons or something. There's a lot of lessons. Yeah, I think this one's 132. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, look at that. Don't, don't make him do anything you know he already knows, right? That's just frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. you know, um, but, but pull out and you could even cover, say, for example, learning to divide by two. Okay. Let's learn to divide by two. Uh, you know, let's sort of look at this, condense this. And, and I want to make sure you know this, he might pick it up in 15 minutes, right? Yeah. Probably. Okay. Mm -hmm. Some kids may be longer. Some kids, maybe that's going to be a real struggle and you'll have to sort of keep at it for a few days. Some kids aren't going to get it, yeah. but they'll get it next year. Yeah. Right. After so, the brain yeah over the summer right yeah exactly you know and it's it's important to have downtime and also a lot of time that we the time that we take off is often the time when oh concept happens yeah. right all of a sudden concept happens for example if you you know threw off everything else and you just started doing some baking with the kids right mm -hmm. and you have your recipe <laughs> you know suddenly you're dividing by two. And so, you know, he would get that, mm -hmm. right? He would get that. And so, you know, maybe even in better and bigger ways than, than the book presents, right? Because yeah. the book has to be kind of systematic, but if you're doing something quite tactile, you know, or, or you could say, okay, let's do some, you know, uh, car math, right? Mm -hmm. As we're driving down the highway, can you divide 12 by two? Can you divide 16 by two? Can you, you know, I mean, car math is great. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. And so those are, you know, and I, I mean, lots of parents are in the same place as you right now. They're just, you know, like, uh, I got to get all the things done. Right. Mm -hmm. It's actually not true. Okay. You know, that's that grade three program that he's working on in Saxon math right now, they have made assumptions about what a grade three, the average grade three kid can take in this year and should know by the end of the year. But it's not crucial. Like every page of that book isn't crucial. Okay. You've probably noticed that as you've been using it, right? Yeah. 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 But then there are things that I guess, cause I, I think I mentioned before I was a Montessori kid. I went through Montessori preschool, pre-K yeah. and kindergarten. Um, and so we learned about cubes and cones and cylinders. Like that was just part of our lessons. Mm -hmm. And then it was in their second grade math book this year. And I realized they didn't know this because I, we didn't have those kind of lessons. And so it was good that we went over it <laughs> and yeah. now they get it, but it is just a very simple thing. You know, I, again, I'm glad it was in the book because I kind of, I guess I, I just assumed they knew it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the reality is if your kid got to 10 mm -hmm. and they didn't know what cubes and cones were, they would know instantly. Yeah. Right. Oh, well that's a cube. We call that a cube. We call that a cone. <laughs> yeah. We would know instantly, even if it wasn't until they got into doing geometry yeah. later on, like, oh, okay, so a dice is a cube and a whatever's a cube. It's not like because you didn't do it then. Yeah. Uh, I'll have to tell you a funny story, actually. There's a, a friend of mine who, yeah, this is years and years ago, she, she had a friend of hers who was a principal of a school, uh -huh. a good friend of the family, and she would come over and she kind of had this habit of grilling her children, you know, because she homeschooled. She kind of had this habit of grilling her children, which is always a bit disconcerting. <laughs> yeah. to think that somebody who's a teacher is going to grill you, right? <laughs> grill your kids. And so she would always be a little bit worried, you know? And so anyway, one day the the you know principal of the school was over visiting for dinner or whatever and she said um uh okay what are the days of the week and she realized that even her oldest kid who was like 12 at the time didn't actually know the days of the week in order 
Oh. <laughs> she was like, oh my gosh, I <laughs> totally failed, right? I've totally failed. And so uh, anyway, she ended up sort of for the next week just hammering them with the days right. of the week. <laughs> Every day was just, we're going to learn the days of the week. You have yeah. to know this. Right. <laughs> That's yeah. funny. My five-year-old today, we were talking about birthdays and he, I realized he didn't know what year he was born. Right. Um, and I mean, I remember growing up in school, uh, they would do fun things like, okay, stand in line in the order of your birthday. So we'd right. all have to know our birthday, you know, month, day, and then year. And so I learned really fast, 11889. Right. And then, but my kids <laughs> don't know that. And so I told my son, I was like, you were born on 8, 13, 14. And he goes, I don't get it. <laughs> so I said, well, you know, August is the eighth month of the year. So we counted the months on our fingers. Right. And then I said, you were born on the 13th day in the year 2014. And he goes, I don't get it. And I was like, okay. <laughs> but you know, fine. one day it'll just, one day it'll just gel. Okay. So your son's born on the August 13th. Uh huh. So my dad's born on August 13th yeah. and my son is born on January 18th. No way. Yeah. How fun! So he's two thousand three. My son's two thousand three, and yeah. yeah. Wow! Isn't that cool? That's really cool. And we'll have to compare birthdays when we're offline, right? <laughs> if we have any other birthdays, right? Yeah. So yeah, where were we? What was we the were question? talking about um, <laughs> the curriculums and picking, and there oh, was how another. Do you choose? Yeah. Yeah, there was another um, book that kind of helped me. Um, and I think it'd be a good stepping stone maybe for some people, um, in, including your, your talk that you mentioned, but have you heard of Laura Burquist's Designing Your Catholic Curriculum? Yes. Yeah. That book's been around for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think my mom gave me her copy or maybe it was my mother-in-law. And one day I opened it up and it was so simple. It was, you know, like it even had a kind of a breakdown of a schedule for people that really like to follow things like that. But yeah. it, it just was really simple. And I think it really helped me think, okay, math, reading and poetry for my kids current ages was really kind of yeah. all you needed to do. Yeah, we way over um, subject our kids to what we feel is, you know, um, important, but a lot of it is enrichment, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're beautiful things to study, but we don't need to weigh ourselves down with them. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, so yeah, so yeah, that's a really nice resource as well. Yeah, I, I would recommend it. Um, and I guess also a lot from you, I'm learning, um, you know, I've heard talk of nature studies and stuff forever. Um, and I've never really been a part of one. But right. we've been pulling out um, our anatomy books that I think I linked a couple weeks back on the podcast. But right. um, it's kind of led the earlier today, we were sitting outside eating lunch. And there was a robin hopping around in our yard. And um, so we, we got to talking about how can a robin see worms that are, you know, in the grass underneath? Like, that just seems kind of impossible. I can't see a worm when I'm just staring at the grass. And... <laughs> That's like seeds coming out of the dirt. <laughs> right, right. And so we just watched. Sense. Yeah. We just watched this robin for a while. And we were talking about just all the different things about birds and then butterflies and and yeah and then my mom told me later it's the birds hear really well so that's what happens but yeah okay. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing right to just wonder and you yeah. can find out later on you don't need the answer in that moment yeah just to be able to wonder you know there's so much around us to learn and it's just so just it you know it's the world is impossibly uh, rich with yeah. things that we could learn. And so, yeah, nature study doesn't need to be a curriculum. Yeah. Right? yeah. We just have to be observant and, and teach our kids how to be. I mean, kids are observant, right? We don't right. need to teach it, but we need to foster that wonder because they will stop wondering at some point if we don't foster it, right? Don't right. Talk about it and don't uh, use it to our advantage for sure. Right. Well, and asking questions is a huge part of it. Yeah. 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 It's a beautiful thing. It is. Yeah. Okay. So, um, our next question is from Maria. Um, and this, I think ties into our last question about picking curriculums. Um, okay. and so she wonders since it's so easy to try and purchase any and all resources, 
Um, do you have any tips on how to moderate what you bring in and also ensure that it's being used? Um, and I think I can relate to that. I have, I have Charlotte Mason books. I have plenty of stuff to use and right. But I don't ever get around to reading it or using it. <laughs> okay, that's why I made, when I made my books, it's the biggest comment I've ever had on them. So my books are all this big, right? <laughs> you know, it's the biggest comment. It's like, I can read it in the evening. Um, <laughs> but, okay, so how do you, uh, sorry, how did she phrase that? How did you, how do you um, monitor? What's yeah. Coming? Yeah, how do you moderate what you bring in? Like, I, I guess basically, right. how do you resist getting something that may look really pretty and sounds really good? And, and yeah, okay. So here's here's I think the the number one thing that you can do to make sure you're not buying things that you're not going to use, um, and you're using your money well, and you're being prudent, and you're not being uh, sort of a panic buying because if you're at a conference or something like that and something's on sale oh well, I wanted that and it's 20% off and maybe I should get it now you know we feel a lot of pressure right or we know you know the so-and-so's down the street they're all there you know they're four-year-olds studying latin and you know why aren't I doing that and they're eight-year-olds studying logic and why aren't I doing that so there's a lot of pressure right yeah um there's the number one question you can ask yourself will this curriculum that I'm thinking of or this activity that I'm about to sign up for mm -hmm. will it add to or detract from my family life? That's a really important question to ask yourselves mm -hmm. because if it's going to add to your family life, you can wait, you can buy it not on sale. If it's going to really enrich your family life, it will be worth it full price or not, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, and it can also wait. If it's going to be that rich and you're going to be benefit that much from it, if mm -hmm. you bought it six months from now or two years from now, it's, it's going to also help you in that same way. Um, if you ever feel pressure, it's not the time to buy it. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, even if it's a really, really good deal, because I think that asking ourselves that question, is this going to add to or detract from my family life? If it just gives us a moment to step back and think about, what it is, what are the expectations? What is the pressure it's going to put on me? How are we going to benefit? Um, is it going to tip the scales? I'm already feeling pretty stressed about what we have to accomplish. Is this new thing going to tip the scales where suddenly I feel like I'm failing? Mm -hmm. um, or uh, is it really the answer to uh, feeling a, um, a richer environment, uh, um, uh, cl closer as a family, more intimate as a family? Is it going to aid what we, our vocation, mm -hmm. essentially, mm -hmm. right? So those are, it's just really, really important to, um, to be aware of when you're, especially at conferences. And I mean, conferences are great and I want to support, absolutely, I tell people all the time, I support the people who've made the effort, they've sifted through all the material, they've they've produced or purchased the, the beautiful material that we want as homeschoolers, but don't feel pressured to buy at the conference. It's a nice place to go and look at it. Um, but think about it, right. Or even just go for a couple of hours and think about it. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it will be there when you come back. Um, but don't let, uh, sort of the, the fact that you're seeing all the, you know, the shiny trinkets in a sense, um, you know, make you feel like you're not doing a good enough job because you could do X, Y, or Z, right. Yeah. Yeah. And so let's say part two of that question, what do we do then when we have curriculum to ensure that it's being used? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I would say if you are using it and that is helping you to educate your children and that is helping you to be kinder um, and that's helping you to feel uh, stronger in your position as a homeschooling mom, yeah. then that's a great thing and you will want to use it. Okay. Mm -hmm. If it's sitting on your shelf and every time you think about grabbing it, it stresses you out, it's not actually helping you. And I would not recommend using it, mm -hmm. right? There might be a time in the future, you don't have to get rid of it. There might be a year or two down the road where suddenly that thing pops out and you think, okay, this is, this is really what I need right now. Um, and this will really aid our family studies as my kids get a little older or as they maybe can study something independently, you know, then you know, don't feel, you don't have to feel like because you're not using something, you wasted your money. Mm -hmm. I've actually had this book. 
I've had it for, oh, I'm going to think 15 years, at least 18 years, maybe. And when I bought it, I thought this is amazing. And it is an amazing book, but it's only this year that suddenly uh, I'm sitting down with Lydia and she's only my, my only kid at home now. And I'm thinking, this is ideal. This is really, her and I are going to get so much out of this. Yeah. But with a group of kids, it just seemed overwhelming. What it's called is a big, thick book. about so that thick. It's called the, for those of you who are listening, it's about four inches thick. It's a, a book called The Timetable of History. And essentially, it goes right from ancient history to present day. And it goes through every sort of um, subject area. So it'll say, what's happening historically, what's happening in music, what's happening in art, what's happening in oh, science, what's happening cool. in technology. And through all those things, what's happening in language. Yeah. And you can look up, you know, um, 3000 BC, what mm -hmm. was going on in all those areas uh, at this time in history. You can look up, you know, uh, 500 AD, what was happening in 500 AD. Yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's just a phenomenal book. But for years, it's been sitting on my shelf. And I thought, I kept thinking one day, that will be really amazing. And I think, uh, I think it was just a little too much to think about with a group of kids. But now there's just one. And this is my year. <laughs> right. That sounds right. excellent. It is. There's a lot of excellent resources, but you know, um, there's, I have a friend who always uses this phrase, uh, the mystery of readiness, right? That sometimes uh -huh. things just have to be in place before we can actually access the good in them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So sometimes we're ready and sometimes we're not, and we have to be okay with it not being the time. Right. Well, yeah. and, and I, this is slightly off topic, but I think still pertinent. Um, I was listening to a podcast and I'm not going to remember which one right now. <laughs> um, but the, the host was talking about books. Actually, I think it may have been read aloud revival. It's one of okay. the people Sarah McKenzie was interviewing. Yeah, I've heard it's a fabulous podcast. It is. And, yeah. um, this gentleman, I think that he's a professor was talking about, they were talking about literature and reading and how there are some excellent authors, but a lot of people have like an inability to read. Um, I've been like that with years for years with Tolkien. I know he's a fabulous author, but it wasn't until COVID that I actually sat down to, to read Lord of the Rings and I love the movies. So I'm a fan yeah. of Lord of the Rings, yeah. but I just, he, his writing was very dense for me. Um, and so this, this, um, gentleman was say, and I can't remember if it was like a Dostoyevsky book or something that he had been trying to read for decades. And right. it wasn't until he hit, I think, 40 or 50 that he was able to sit down and read it and really enjoy it and get yeah. what he needed out of it. And so it's sometimes people, I guess, are just like late bloomers with certain books. And anyway, yeah. I just thought. And I think that, you know, in the, first of all, I think literature is something that we, we build a foundation on, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, my daughter and I were just talking about this and we, we just before the podcast started, I, uh, we were, um, had to drive my husband to get his car. It was being repaired. And on our way back, we were talking about, uh, you know, reading different things at different ages. Right. Mm -hmm. And so one of those was, you know, the layers of Narnia, how, you know, she said, well, the first time I read it, you know, she was probably only seven, mm -hmm. you know, it, it was beautiful and it sort of struck her at one level. And then again, you know, maybe at 10 or 11, she read it again, it struck her at a different level. And as an adult, it will also strike you at a very different level. So the layers happen, but I think our, our layers, you know, have to be in terms of exposing ourselves to beautiful literature because some literature is harder to read than others. Yeah. And so if we can get comfortable with this layer, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then we can move on to the next layer right mm -hmm. and so i've just started reading some russian literature in the last couple of years mm -hmm. right and and it's like wow this is this is beautiful you know yeah. i think if i picked it up 10 years ago even it uh, you know mystery of readiness right i wouldn't right. have been ready and so but and and i 10 years ago i probably would have thought well I'll, I'll never enjoy that yeah you know it's just too uh i feel like i'm wading through it you know and yeah. and all of a sudden it's like okay it's not like that anymore right yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then also when you were talking about the, the big, awesome book, um, I thought of a game my mother-in-law got us for Christmas. It's, it's like a little, I mean, you could almost just carry it with you anywhere. It's so small, but it's a game of ordering events in history. 
So oh, you get, fun. it's so much fun. And I, I looked it up really quick and then I can also, we can provide the link, but it's called okay, Timeline. This is I want. Yeah, it's called Timeline Events. And um, so they have the, the dates on one side and then on the other side of the card, it's just like the name. So when were blue jeans invented? Or when was fire wow. invent, like invented, you know, or discovered? Right. Um, yeah. And so the game is you're supposed to, you start with three cards and you have to put them in order. And if you get it wrong, you have to draw another card. So it's whoever has, you know, right. puts oh. all their cards down. And my sons love it. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. We'll find the link. Send me the name. We'll put the link in for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's sounds like every homeschooler's dream. Don't you think? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if, if there's enough time in between playing, you don't remember. So it's yeah. still kind of interesting. You know, yeah. 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 There's enough diversity in this small deck of cards that it's still, you know, which one goes first, the hot air balloon or the telephone, you know, like, right. Just fun stuff oh, like that. Fun. Yeah. 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 So it's almost six o'clock. So should we wrap up? Yes. Yep. Okay. That's, we've done all the questions. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll put all necessary links in the, um, in the, uh, show notes. And, um, just so people know, if you want to give us questions, you can put them on my Facebook page, make joy normal or message me privately there. Uh, you can also email me via my website, bonnielandry.ca. Uh, and our YouTube channel is up and running. We're getting lots of, um, this podcast is also available on YouTube. So uh, if you'd rather watch us, um, you're welcome to do that. <laughs> and I know. And um, uh, anything else? Is, oh yeah, I know. I have one more thing to on sign off. Um, last week, I think I mentioned that I was going to do a class on writing. Did I mention that? On yep. last podcast? Okay. So the a date for that is established. It's going to be a Saturday morning. Um, I've had, uh, interestingly, some people back East, so we're in Pacific time here, back East, um, say the times are difficult, you know, when I do it in the afternoon. Um, and also some people from the UK would like to participate. So I thought, well, I'll do it on Saturday morning. And then if people um, from different time zones want to participate, then then they can. Uh, so that is actually up on my blog already. I put the sign up sheet for that on my blog. So I'll put that link in the um, in the uh, show notes as well. But the idea behind it being that we're laying a foundation for writing. So if you have very young kids, it would still be appropriate. Uh, laying a foundation for writing because writing is a lot based on your experience, right? What you're able to write is based on what you has gone into your brain. And so let's talk about that. Talk about how to structure a paragraph. It's about writing a paragraph because if we can't write a paragraph, we're stuck. We can't really write anything because the paragraph is the building block. So that's what I'll be focusing on. It'll be a one hour class and then a one hour Q&A after um, with some resource sheets and whatnot to go along with it and some templates um, for writing as well. So, so there you go. Right. Okay. God bless and good night. Thank you. Good night.